Hello everyone. We are going to be talking about the common cold today for your adult patients. Um, but before we do that, I just wanted to real quickly show you something else I planted. Planted. I. <laughs> uh, sorry. Uh, garden on gardening on my mind. Um, I posted. I didn't plant. I posted it on Blackboard. Um, this is uh, from a book called Rapid Review Pathology um, from Dr. Edward Goulion. Um, this is a great table from that book. It's a great book in general just for studying and stuff. It's a board review book uh, that that we like, uh, my wife and I both like. But um, I posted a PDF there, but it's a great summary of respiratory microbial pathogens. Great, great, great. It says, you know, what they are and then gives you discussion just kind of, you know, how to treat it, what to prescribe for it, etc. Um, it also refers to some images, which I include in the, in the bottom. So it has viruses, it has bacterial infections, etc. So you'll notice with, and it has just good, good things about it. So anyways, it's, I think it's a good one stop. I know it's, it's a big chart. It's a lot of things. It's nine pages. Um, there's a lot going on. It has some images here. Oh, and actually the last page is almost completely blurry. So it's really like seven pages, but you know, it's still, it's a lot of stuff. And I would definitely highly recommend you guys look at this. I believe it would help you study for ICM. Um, and I think it'll help you when you're on rotations and then as a practitioner. Um, and definitely, I think it'll also be beneficial for your board exam. So um, definitely take a look at this. Um, I'm not necessarily going to be putting, pulling test questions from it, um, but I definitely wanted to provide it during this module for you guys. And I wanted to make sure that you guys were aware of it. And like I said, if you are having... If you want to get the book, it's Rapid Review Path or Pathology, the Rapid Review series with by Edward Goulion, um, Dr. Edward Goulion. And um, if you you just email me if you have trouble finding the book or whatever, if you want to pick it up or buy it, they have it's PDF too. I think some of the students last year had it and they had PDFs, so I don't know if they're gonna be nice or not, and maybe share them with you or tell them where they got theirs or whatever. Um, but anyways, um, or just buy it because I'm not condoning officially on this recording that you get any pirated versions or anything, but I'm just saying. Um, but, but I will provide this on Blackboard. You'll have that to look at. So please um, keep this for studying purposes. So let me close that. Um, this will be on my exam, the common cold. There'll be some things in here I want to make sure you guys pay attention to and know. Um, I did pick the common cold because it's common, right? It's the most frequent acute illness in the U.S. and throughout the industrialized world. So I'm going to be a betting man and almost guaranteed you guys are going to see this out in definitely in rotations and then out in practice. And unfortunately, you guys are probably going to get this and your, you know, family, friends, loved ones, children, etc. Unfortunately, will have exposure to this. And this is something that just everyone has to live with as being a human, unfortunately. Um, but anyways, it's usually benign. It's usually self-limited, but People still go to the doctors. They still miss work. They still don't feel good. Uh, they don't like to do things, right? But And these are caused by viruses, which is important, and we'll touch upon that later, but these are viral infections. Um, so this is what people refer to when they talk about the common cold. Um, so it is okay in healthcare to, you know, even with healthcare practitioners to, to refer to it as the common cold, even though it is also the lay term or what the lay public uses. Um, but just know here that these are the symptoms, signs and symptoms. And I believe most of you guys are probably familiar with these. Um, and um, probably personally, you know, or if not through family family and friends, loved ones, etc. cetera. Um, it is important to note that it is different than influenza. It is different than the flu and then some of these other things too. So hopefully we'll be learning those differences on how to diagnose those. And the clinical presentation hopefully will be clear um, in your course like ICM. I think they'll be covering that uh, so you can be able to distinguish between common cold versus influenza versus a bacterial pharyngitis, et cetera. Um, so, so just note that too, that, you know, um, that will affect what, how you treat. So today we're just gonna be talking about the common cold and what's recommended for the treatment and then prevention of that. There are some varying stages of symptoms. Um, mild symptoms typically don't require people to, um, to have treatment. It's going to really depend on the patient and then what symptoms they're having. And then also, too, you know, what do they do for a living? Are they a student or not? Or, you know, what type of job do they have? Um, and so this is really kind of a, a personal thing. But um, And then part of the kind of proper diagnosis and, um, and then how you decide to treat the patient. Moderate, severe 
um, is what most people have. And again, usually if they have mild symptoms, um, they don't, you don't see them. They don't seek out a healthcare professional. It typically a person has to be, um, have moderate to severe symptoms before they go try to, you know, go see a PA, um, get an appointment with a healthcare provider. Um, and I mean, unless maybe they're elderly or something, you know, if they may have another disease, they have other things going on, maybe you'll see them with mild symptoms, but, um, really it's, it's really the moderate to severe. And that's what we're going to focus on with as far as the treatment is concerned. I'm going to read through this slide, but just basically saying that um, there is a lot of different opinions and stuff as far as what is best. And you'll hear a lot of there's um, a lot of old wives tales and a lot of recommendations and stuff that are passed around by, uh, you know, non healthcare practitioners, etc. And then hopefully this this presentation will will kind of focus you guys on what is, you know, most medically appropriate to do for your patients in the future. So here we have the, the things that you want to think about doing. So first, it's, it's going to be predominantly um, symptom treatment. So you're going to want to look at the symptomology and want to, it's palliative care. You want to make the person feel more comfortable and then help them specifically with their symptoms. Um, so if they have pain, you want to prescribe an analgesic and we'll go through those. So, and they can have pain, unfortunately, kind of all over, um, just depends on the patient. And then if they have, you know, nasal symptoms, you can do things like uh, chromalin, which you guys hopefully remember that's a mass cell stabilizer. Um, so that could be beneficial. Ipreptropium, anticholinergic, that can also be beneficial. We'll talk about it a little bit. Um, and then two, if they have a cough or not, do you want to give a cough suppressant like dextromethorphan, which you haven't talked about yet, um, but that is, there's an over-the-counter product. Um, it's also in some prescription products, but it's in combination with some other things, but you can get it over the counter. Um, most people are familiar with it as um, as part of Robitussin. So Robitussin DM, over-the-counter um, that's guafenicin with dextromethorphan, robitussin. But so you may have seen that or, or used it over the counter. They also make it by itself. Um, I believe Delsum is the is the brand name. But yeah, they make dextromethorphan just by itself as a cough suppressant. Um, so that's when we'll we'll talk about it later in more in depth. But in other modules is what I meant to say. But but anyways, and so take on point for this slide is just that you know look at the patient and what symptoms listen to the <laughs> look at the patient and listen to the patient and um, if and believe them if they're saying that they have ear pain or whatever then you want to treat the ear pain with an analgesic maybe um, of the analgesics so you can use Tylenol which is generic of acetaminophen or you can use NSAIDs uh, which are things like ibuprofen naproxen they're over the counter also prescription strength or they, they make it in higher strengths um, those can be very effective in um, in treating an analgesia, and they are usually well tolerated. You usually don't have to be too concerned with adverse effects, um, especially with Tylenol. It's usually well to tolerated. The, the thing that people get in trouble with with Tylenol is overdose. Overdosing can be an issue, and that's usually when you have uh, toxicity. And it's, it's it's hepatotoxic specifically. It kills the liver. Um, but you know, so as long as the patient's staying under four grams a day, four thousand milligrams, four grams a day, um, or more conservatively, you can set the limit at three thousand um, milligrams or three grams a day, um, depending on the patient or how conservative you want to be with your dosing. But um, but that's usually the only problems that people have with the acetaminophen um, is that overdosing. Um, and then with the NSAIDs, they're usually well tolerated. Um, GI problems are. GI adverse effects are usually what's problematic. So um, taking the NSAIDs with food, so taking ibuprofen with food can help mitigate that and help. Um, but unfortunately, the NSAIDs can cause ulcers and stomach discomfort, stomach, stomach pain, and especially at higher doses. Um, so that is something to think about. And then also there's some hypertension implications too with the NSAIDs. So that could be problematic, again, depending on the specific patient. But in general, if it's short term, if it's lower doses, it's an acute issue, right? It's a common cold. They hopefully won't have it for a really long time. Um, then that is these acetaminophen or Tylenol or NSAIDs um, can be effective. So you can go with, with either of those. They make antihistamine decongestant combinations, um, and so these may be beneficial, and again, especially if a person has the congestion with some, maybe like a runny nose. So the antihistamine would help with the runny nose, but then the decongestant would help the, the congestion, or the um, antihistamine would help with maybe if they had itchy eyes or if they had eye problems or whatever. Um, but anyways, but the... But with the antihistamines, you do have to be concerned about adverse effects. So you guys hopefully remember that from my presentation before, especially the first generation, right? The first generation have a lot more problems with adverse effects. So if you are going to go with an antihistamine 
I would recommend, and the experts agree, it's not just my opinion, um, that you go with a second generation antihistamine because you have less risk of sedation, um, less risk of problematic anticholinergic adverse effects. You guys hopefully remember that, right? Um, so second generation are usually preferred. Um, dexamethorphan, here it is again. We talked about it. It's an antitussive. It helps with uh, perspex cough. Um, rarely needed, so it's really just going to be on an as-needed basis. Just if your patient is just really complaining about the cough and it's really problematic or whatever, um, then, you know, so it is, you can highlight here, when needed, PRN as needed. Um, and as far as adverse effects go, it can cause some sedation maybe, so that may be an issue. So again, you know, do not operate heavy machinery. Uh, maybe take it at nighttime. Um, I know sometimes too, some patients like this closer to bedtime, so they like the, uh, like, uh, well, NyQuil is one that has a dextromethorphan in it, a cough suppressant, um, or it can have. It depends on the preparation. A lot of these over-the-counter preparations, like the Robitussins, you always have to check the label because they'll have a brand name, you know, Robitussin, and then they'll make a lot of different products within it. So some of these, I guess I should say, antitussive over-the-counter preparations, um, they... Um, you can take them at bedtime if, if, if like the cough's waking the person up and it's problematic or, you know, disrupting their sleep or whatever. They're not able to rest. Uh, but it's definitely just as needed. It's not something you need to blanket and give to everyone. There's also the, uh, we talked about chromalin in our previous presentation, but that is a mast cell stabilizer. And this can be Im help improve the cold symptoms um, because of, uh, it'll help with runny nose, you know, et cetera. Uh, watery eyes and stuff, depending on um, what specifically the patient has. Um, so that may be a strategy, too, to use chromalin, again, as needed. Um, you can also go with an anticholinergic intranasal spray. That can also help um, with the, the runny nose, sneezing. Um, you, you, it is an anticholinergic medication, but you don't have to be as concerned with the anticholinergic adverse effects because you have limited systemic exposure. It's still there and it's still a possibility, but uh, not as bad as if you're giving it systemically. So um, there are some therapies, unfortunately, that are out there that have minimal or uncertain benefits. And so um, they may be reasonable options or maybe not. So zinc is one that's popular. If you guys have seen that over the counter get asked about a lot in the pharmacy, but they, they do have a lot of zinc products um, that <clears throat> basically it's kind of the jury's out. They're not, you're not saying that they're bad, but not saying, but they overall don't, they don't recommend them because they can have, because of some adverse effects. So specifically they can cause the, the loss of smelling. So a nosmia, um, which is, you know, you lose the ability to smell. Um, and so because of that, you know, they're not um, recommended for everybody and it's not um, not kind of a gold star recommendation. Decongestants. So again, if they're congested as needed, you can prescribe things or rather advise them to get over the counter things like pseudofedrin. Um, this can help. This is the one though, it is um, restricted use because this can be used to make um, methamphetamines. Um, so that's something you have to note. And, and the other issue too with pseudofedrin is that it is not recommended or it can be problematic for people who have hypertension. So the pseudofedrin can actually make their blood pressure, uh, blood pressure go up. So a person with hypertension should not be taking this um, regularly or long term. Um, and it is unfortunately something I come across in the pharmacy because it is over the counter. Um, I sometimes will sometimes know in the pharmacy if the person has hypertension because they either tell us or we're filling their antihypertensive medications. But then, you know how it is with pharmacies. I mean, you can go to any pharmacy to fill a prescription and then you can go to any pharmacy to buy something over the counter. So sometimes I don't know if they have a hypertension. So it is something I try to warn about in the pharmacy and it's something to think about as a, uh, as a practitioner. They have phenylephrine also over the counter. It's less effective, but it is relatively better than pseudoephedrine if a person does have high blood pressure. So and um, and then the phenylephrine is not restricted like the pseudoephedrine is, um, so that's something that could be an alternative if the person has hypertension. Uh, so it's important to note that. Make sure you, um, topical decongestants. I definitely do not recommend. I this is things like um, they have over the counter. The brand name is Afrin, um, which I don't know if you guys are familiar with that or if I've ever seen that. The generic is oxymetolazine, um, and so it's an alpha one adrenergic receptor agonist. 
and alpha-2 adrenergic receptor partial agonist. Um, but topical decongestant, the big, big issue with it, and you'll see, I don't know if you guys are ever on Reddit or I don't know what you guys do online, but um, you can Google search, you know, Afrin addiction. So it's kind of kind of funny, but it's, it's true. They can cause um, rebound congestion. So they actually can make the... Um, the congestion worse. And on top of that too, they can cause nosebleeds, agitation, insomnia. Um, and then they also are not good for people who have hypertensive or who have hypertension or are hypertensive um, because, and so they're not recommended for people who have preexisting hypertension. Again, over the counter, people are kind of, they're free to buy them and everything. Um, but then the kind of the joke is, and this, they mentioned this in pharmacy school too, that, you know, you know, if you're addicted because you have Afrin everywhere, you have one in your office drawer, you have one in your backpack, you have it in your car, you have it in, in your kitchen, you have it in your bathroom. Um, because again, that rebound, um, that rebound conge congestion, um, rebound, uh, rhinitis um, can help can um, can can hurt rather so it can only be helpful then or again so as far as the labeling is going to only helpful and should only be used for two to three days but it's unfortunately i mean something that's really hard to only use for a day or two because it works really well so it it clears a person up so people like it because it's they're congested and don't feel well they spray some afrin up there and it clears them up right away. So then they're like, this is great. They're not going to only use it for two to three days, right? They're just keep using it. Um, but anyway, so definitely don't recommend that. And again, like pseudoephedrine, not recommended if someone has hypertension. Saline nas nasal spray, it, the, the data is not that great as far as does it help or not. Um, and it's not really concluded to be uh, beneficial. Um, but honestly, for me, over the counter, if a person comes and they don't want to take a drug or they can't because of they're pregnant or they have other comorbidities or they're on a lot of drugs or they're on other drugs that have drug interactions. Um, I will recommend the saline nasal spray. Some people have, they have a, um, a symptomatic re response to it or, or it is beneficial. So it can be too. Sometimes I've noticed too with pediatricians will recommend it for pediatric patients again, because you know, you want to expose the kids to drugs or not, or, um, and this is, so it's just basically like, they also have the neti pot too, which I don't know if you guys have, have seen. Let me, so the neti pot here, they have a lot of different devices. They sell them over the counter. Um, but these, um, it's just, <laughs> that guy is funny. I didn't know that that was it. Um, but yeah, you basically, it's, it's a mechanical washing of the nose. Um, so this is something too. It's kind of like the saline nasal spray. So the neti pot, you actually have to use gravity. Like you can see this guy is really excited about it. You use gravity to kind of flush your nose out. And it's an ancient treatment. I mean, people have been doing this. Um, I know my wife's from Nepal. They have been doing it in Nepal for a long time or whatever, um, an old, older remedy. But it is definitely something that if a person doesn't want to have medications or um, they um, are interested in you know doing something or they, they feel like they need to kind of flush things out, it's not... Not horrible. Okay, so as far as like treating the cold, it's not going to treat or cure your cold, um, but it may help with some of the symptoms. Um, and so again, maybe something to and you know and just and part of it's personal. So I, I'm not <laughs> I'm not endorsed by the neti pot or anything. I don't have any financial benefit. But sometimes I just like the saline sprays because my nose feels drying and whatever, and it's just gunked up, and it's just nice to kind of wash out my nose. So same thing too. I mean, you can also just in the shower, just suck water up your nose and stuff. Some people say it feels like they're drowning, but, um, but anyways, you can do that too. And again, it's, it's just that, that idea of kind of like rinsing out and cleaning your nose is beneficial and it, and it can, can, um, can be good to actually help prevent, um, you know, too much gunk being in your nose, so to speak. Uh, but anyway, so this is also going to be an as needed recommendation, just depends on your patient. And then some people hate these nasal sprays too. So don't force somebody to do it. Uh, they hate spraying things in their nose. Um, so that's something too, to think about. Expectorant. So this is um, Mucinex over the counter. Guafenicin is the um, expectorant. And the guafenicin is in a number of different products over the counter. So again, read your labels when you're looking at over the counter medications. I sometimes wonder if like it'd be a good idea, or it'd be cool or fun. Probably not. But to take you guys to like HEB or Walgreens and be like, hey, let's check these out. See them like read ingredients. So we know what these are. But anyways, you guys can do that on your free time if you're really bored. And I know you won't, but it's okay. Uh, that's what that's what us dorky pharmacy students do when we learn about these drugs. We go to the farm, the over the counter section, we check it out. But uh, but anyways, you guys are <laughs> don't have to do that. Um, but yeah, so guafenicin's in a lot of different products. It's in expectorant, um, but it, it, the, again, it's sort of like not maybe that great. Uh, the the um, 
the the the, uh, the research and stuff isn't very um, th- there isn't very strong evidence in, in its effectiveness. Um, so this is something that um, they've also shown that there's been benefits with just drinking water. So the staying hydrated is good for a lot of different reasons. Um, and so if a person has a common cold, it's it's beneficial for that. But they also have found that drinking water can also um, help you know cough things up or help you and it's kind of a, a natural so to speak expectorant um and then the, the interesting thing too with guafenicin you're supposed to drink it with lots of water so i remember in pharmacy school they were like i don't know if it's just is it actually the medication or is it the fact that the person's just drinking so much more water because the medication is supposed to be drunk drink with a lot of water so i don't know some people like it a lot and um again as needed if a person's really into mucinex or they really feel like it's beneficial i mean you know, you can prescribe it, but, um, but for the common cold, um, you know, um, maybe not, um, maybe not something you'd want to do routinely. Um, it's mainly just used for if a person can, for whatever reason, cannot cough up, you know, um, or is having trouble coughing up the, the gunk in their lungs or, you know, on their own. Herbal products. So there are herbal products over the counter. Um, so this specific one they mentioned, I hadn't heard of it, but, um, they, just showing that there basically needs further studies and they're not sure about that. Uh, but I want to take a time, a second here to go on a little field trip, just one sec. So here I wanted to show you about how um, the FDA unfortunately um, does not um, regulate over-the-counter herbal and dietary supplements here in the U.S. So those are um, things that are they're very popular. So vitamin supplements stuff, they're very popular and they can be beneficial and there can be some, some good things. And, um, I'm, I'm not saying anything, anything bad about them specifically. Unfortunately, they are not verified like they are in other countries. So apparently Germany has really good standards. And so if you ever get, if you're ever in Germany, check out their supplement section. I don't know. I've never been there. Um, but yeah, that, that unfortunately is problematic here in the U S um, because the FDA does not. Um, so I just found this on the consumer Consumer Reports website, which is pretty good. Shout out to my grandma. She recommends. She's always trying to get me to read Consumer Reports. Charles, there was an article in Consumer Reports. That's my impersonation of my grandma. Um, but anyway, so this actually is a, a good a good source, good table here. Um, just if you have trouble finding this, um, let me know. I can send it to you. Make sure you guys get it. But um, if you are going to buy supplements or over the counter, I do recommend patients the same thing in the pharmacy to look for these labels. There's consumer labs, there's NSF, US Pharmacopeia, USP, and then UL. Um, these are all independent labs that verify them because unfortunately there have been instances and in reports and um, documented cases of people, you know, selling supplements that they claim they have, let's say 150 milligrams or whatever of vitamin C. And then it f- turns out that a lab will study it and they have one milligram of vitamin C instead of 150, or they have zero milligrams of vitamin C and they only have like sugar and powder or whatever. Um, so unfortunately that can happen. So the reason I like these, these symbols here, I mean, one thing is you can go with big reputable con- companies, but, um, unfortunately, or some people will say that unfortunately there's, there have been issues with that. Like I, I believe the, the, uh, the target brand and I forgot what brand, what the I think it's called Up. Okay, Up and Up. I forgot the, the second Up. Up and Up. Um, there was there was some pro- problems with some of their products. It wasn't the whole brand, so I mean, it's not. But there were some. There were certain supplements that were in the news um, a couple years back um, from the Up and Up, which is you know it's a big name and you know Target apologized and everything. And apparently it was like some one manufacturing facility that they weren't going to do business with anymore, whatever, whatever it was. But um, so that unfortunately can be an issue. Nature Made is the one that I believe they sell at Walmart and maybe Target. But again, big company, but, you know, unfortunately, they sometimes can be, I'll stop getting distracted. I was just looking around. Um, those those can be problematic. So I like to see these on here, on here if you can. Um, so if you go to the consumerlab.com or, or you look up these, they'll have, they'll, these companies will provide lists. And then the other thing too, is you can look for these labels on the um, the supplement itself. So it's, it's, um, again, if you want to take a field trip to the, to the pharmacy or next time you're in there, or if you buy supplements or whatever, I don't know. Um, or if your family and friends do, I know a lot of my, my family and, um, they like supplementation. So I definitely let them know about this. The other thing I tell them too, is like, if you can get it in your diet, if for example, vitamin C, get it in your diet. But then if you need to take a supplement, if you have a true lab deficiency, so if you're deficient in vitamin D, you're not able to get it from the sunlight, um, or you have some deficiency or whatever, 
and you have to take a vitamin D supplement, you know, this is, I'm speaking to my grandma again. <laughs> um, she needs to take vitamin C because she doesn't go out in the sun enough. Um, you know, I want her to make sure she's getting one with one of these four things. Um, you have to look at this too because they're, they're a little bit of controversy about some of this because some are, they're sponsored and they're paid by the company and some aren't. But anyways, um, I at least like to see this um, there for that. So I'll get off my soapbox. So hopefully that's clear. But these Consumer Lab, NSF, USP, and UL are the four that I like to look at um, or I like to see um, if you are going to get supplementations over the counter. The other thing too, real quick to note is that if you look at the ingredient list, I've noticed on some of these supplementations, it they will have you know, whatever the ingredient, like there's four things that are ingredients. Well, it'll be interesting that like the vitamin D will be USP verified, but then something else in it is not USP verified, which if it's the active ingredient, I'm fine with it. The whole product doesn't necessarily have to be USP verified. Um, so I don't necessarily need them to verify that the other excipients or the other, the non-active things in the, the drug are what they say they are. Um, but I would at least like to see if the main ingredient is vitamin D and then right next to it says USP verified. Well, that's good because at least I know, you know, I'm buying and ingesting the vitamin D that the product says it has in it. Um, so anyways, that is um, some good resources there. And again, just FYI, I'm not going to test you over that. I think it's just beneficial for your friends and family and for yourselves and future patients and everything. So get off my soapbox there. Zinc, uh, we talked about a little bit, but it's just basically, um, you know, because of adverse effects, um, it's not always recommended, but there have been some evidence showing that it can help reduce the duration and severity of the cold symptoms. So I don't know where it's going to go as far as the evidence, if it's still going to be, um, you know, concerned because of the, um, because of the adverse effects or not. Um, but the FDA issued a public health advisory about it. Um, and so they should not be used for um, because of multiple reports of the uh, the loss of smell. So, um, and that's the Zycam, which is the one that's really popular, intranasal. Um, it does seem like the syrup and the longitudes have to be, are what better tolerated. So um, that could be something you just get a zinc, zinc uh, lotion or um, one of those cough drops that have zinc in it. Um, that may be something to, to look at. Another quick note too, with the homeopathic preparations, just again, globally and what we're taught in pharmacy school is that the homeopathic preparations, again, are another thing that are not regulated. And so as pharmacists, we typically don't recommend the homeopathic preparations um, because they aren't, haven't been shown to have benefit um, in, you know, in clinical trials, et cetera. So that's another note too on there. Um, to typically, we recommend if our pharmacists recommend patients to stay away from the homeopathic um, preparations. But yeah, it's interesting stuff if you want to read about it a little bit more, but I won't spend too much on it. But anyway, so take on point with zinc, um, FDA advisory because of the uh, loss of smell and that with that Zycam, but then maybe um, syrup or lodgings are the better way to go. I also think too, there's there's going to be more research done in this area because there have been some, some kind of benefits shown and there have been some promise shown with the zinc. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what you guys in future practice if you guys are going to be prescribing this all the time, or it's going to be like, oh, no way it causes all these other side effects, you know, who knows which way it's going to go. Ineffective therapy. So those are the ones that were kind of on the fence, therapies with minimal uncertain, you know, kind of can do it, not do it, you know, um, as needed. But ineffective ones are ones that you should should avoid. Uh, there's enough evidence out, sh out there showing that they are ineffective and should not be prescribed or um, advised. Antibiotics, definitely. So these are viral infections. Um, so, and this is from up to date too. I'm not picking on anybody or whatever. The experts at up to date agree that antibiotics, unfortunately, are prescribed. So antibiotics are antibacterial agents, right? Or they kill by, and then they are prescribed for these viral infections, the common cold, and it's inappropriate. So it should not be done, unfortunately. It is something that's done, and the big take-home point is that well, it's unnecessary cost, it's unnecessary adverse effects, it's un, it's you know just a lot of things that um, a lot of potential harms. But the biggest issue, and again, this is a worldwide issue, is the increased risk of developing resistance. So this overprescription of antibiotics for the common cold, you know, I'd, hopefully you guys are learning how to diagnose the common cold properly so that you're not prescribing antibiotics for that. Any histamines, um, you know. They can maybe be used, minimal benefit, frequently result in troublesome side effects. But um, so especially with first generation, um, limit limit their use. Um, and diphenhydramine is Benadryl. So it, it can work and people do, well, they will go to it. Um, but if they are going to use the antihistamine, like I said before, maybe stick to the second generation. Um, and then it may be something that they, they don't really need to do if they have just the common cold. 
Antiviral is another one too. It is a viral infection, but um, it's been shown to not be worth prescribing an antiviral therapy. So go ahead and read through that. Um, herbal remedies, I already talked about vitamin C is another one too that, um, that, you know, is really not been shown to really reduce symptoms, duration or severity. Um, you end up actually peeing out a lot of your, a lot of the vitamin C you take as a supplement anyway. So you don't really even end up fully ingesting it. Um, and so again, I try not to be too, um, too discouraging to patients if this is something they're just really into or they really like vitamin C or, um, they like the taste of it or whatever, but I just would encourage them to, especially in the Valley, I mean, South Texas has a ton of great citrus. I, I encourage them to ingest the vitamin C in a food form. So what foods are high in vitamin C and then just go ahead and eat that food, right? So, um, because the supplement, like I said, mainly it's peed out, um, you know, with the, like, let's say you're eating an orange, not only are you getting the vitamin C, but then you're getting fiber, you're getting other minerals and nutrients and, um, especially if you're eating like a good locally grown, organically grown, delicious, fresh orange or grapefruit or whatever you guys like, lemons or whatever, whatever citrus down there you guys like to eat, um, then, you know, you're getting the benefits of all that other stuff too. So um, I usually, again, I'm not super harsh with people because that's just not my style, but um, I'm like, hey, vitamin T is great. Um, there's not a lot of evidence showing that it's going to help with your cold. Um, but definitely by all means, if while you have your cold and you don't feel well, if you enjoy eating things that have vitamin C, eat more of those things that have vitamin C. Um, and that's kind of where I sort of, it's sort of a deflection. It's kind of a, you know, Hey, it's not really that great for vitamin for the cold, but <laughs> you know, I don't want to discourage them from eating good produce and stuff, right? Good thing, good food that has high in vitamin C. Um, but anyway, so yeah, but and the reason I spend a little more time on vitamin C, cause it's very, very popular. It's ubiquitous. Um, everyone's asking about it. I feel like there's a lot of ads about it. It's, it's kind of everywhere. Everybody in my family has always asked me about it too, vitamin C. Um, and I'm like, just eat citrus. You guys live in South Texas. Come on. What do you, uh, what do you, don't take the tablet or whatever. And then there's the other layer too. These the vitamin C aren't necessarily regulated by the FDA. So are you even taking vitamin C in that tablet form or in that packet form or whatever? Um, unless it, remember, unless it has like the USP verification or NSF or, uh, UL, et cetera, um, consumer labs, um, it may not even be vitamin C, but if you're <laughs> eating an orange, um, and I'm pausing here, unless it's some really shady farmer or something, I mean, <laughs> you buy an orange from somebody that should be an orange, right? That's, but anyways, uh, stop talking about that. Echinacea. This is interesting. This has actually been around since native American times. Um, as far as being a remedy for a lot of different things, the native Americans here in the, in the U S would use, or the Americas, I believe, I don't think, uh, they didn't have the political boundaries that we call the United States, right? But in so in the in the uh, Native American territories, um, they would use this as for a lot of different things. They found it at some grave sites, some ancient sites. Um, pretty cool. It's from the cone flower, the prairie cone flower. So up here in Missouri, we see it growing all over the place. We have some growing in our garden too, um, which is they're really beautiful. Um, so it's interesting because they've been shown that they have some positive effect and they actually have some immune stimulating effects. Um, it, it's, and it's basically, they're still doing, they don't have enough evidence is it's kind of, um, it is relatively safe. There have been some GI adverse effects. Um, some people can be allergic to it, so that can be problematic. Um, but you know, so it's kind of like the jury's out. They're not really sure if it's going to be effective or not. There's basically, there's not enough research that's been done. Um, so that's something that, you know, maybe stay tuned and we'll see. And then the other big issue too, like what I touched on before, these herbal products, unfortunately are not regulated by the FDA. And so, um, if you are going to go with echinacea product, um, I would definitely recommend again, that it has that independent lab verification to make sure you are getting what you say you're getting our and Or the other thing too, is that if you, um, know of anyone that uses it traditionally in traditional medicine, um, I'd be curious to know, you know, how do they prepare it? If any, um, you know, what do they do historically? What do the Native American Americans do with it? Cause I, I read something about it a while ago and I forgot, but they, I, I was surprised at all the stuff that they, the, the tribes would use it for. It was, it was kind of cool. Um, I mean, as far as a long list and stuff, but, uh, but anyway, so kind of stay tuned, but as of now it is considered ineffective. And again, it's just hard to verify that you're actually taking what the, uh, the manufacturer is claiming. They, in pharmacy school, they always said that you were taking, that you might be taking, you know, they might put grass clippings in a capsule and sell it to you, which I don't know why they always say grass clippings, but, but it's just, I think to highlight the point that, um, there is a variability with, with those products, unfortunately. 
Um, intranasal steroids are they are they have their use and uh, they can be used for some things, but they should not be used uh, for the common cold. Uh, they're ineffective. Um, heated humidified air is another one too that's not really it's not going to help as far as treat the cold. Um, some people like it, and again, this is something where like, you come across patients that just like it and they want to use it. it. You know, I mean, in South Texas, it's humid, so humid all the time. I don't think they'll really need it, but in northern climates, uh, in the winter time. People like, you know, um, a humidifier and stuff. And so if they're not feeling well and it helps them sleep better, um, just let them know it's not going to treat your your cold. It's not going to make you necessarily, you know, get rid of the virus. But it if it helps you sleep and makes you feel better, it's really not super harmful. So it's not something that, you know... Um, something to worry about there is the potential for mild thermal in injury so i mean that's just kind of just using the product safety i mean safely i think that's kind of like too like with a toaster you can burn your hand or whatever but um but this, so this is something with patients you know it's not just let them know it's not gonna cure you but if you like it and it helps you sleep better i mean getting better you know healing from a disease part of that's related to sleep so my my opinion is kind of um you know if it doesn't hurt them, you know, not that big a deal. But anyways, codeine. So codeine is a very effective antitussive medication. It's a very good cough suppressant. Um, but uh, we're going to talk about it a little bit more in the future, but it's not recommended for the common cold. Um, and it's just basically it's shown to not really have much effect over placebo. And you're just really exposing these in person to adverse effects, etc. cetera. Um, prevention. So prevention is really going to be a uh, an important strategy. Um, and... Like I said, unfortunately, despite ads and stuff, you know, taking vitamin C um, or other, some of these other herbal products is not a, a guaranteed way to prevent this from happening. Unfortunately, it's just part of just um, modern times. It's part of just the human condition, um, just part of being a human, unfortunately. Um, so and like I said, too, if they are really stuck on taking those vitamins, just encourage them to eat the food, you know, because I mean, everyone can benefit from eating more fruits and vegetables and then. You know, just like, hey, you really like vitamin C? Just what foods are high in vitamin C? Let's eat some more of those and you'll feel great. <laughs> no, hopefully it'll make you feel better. And um, the one that has shown to be effective and has a lot of research backing it up is hand hygiene. So I believe you guys are going to be being taught that proper technique in lab. I can't remember if it's this semester or next semester, but hand washing is a big, big deal. It seems so stupid or like like my four-year-old daughter is being taught hand washing in her school she goes to so it's like it just seems like oh it's such a kindergarten thing and so like not that big a deal but no it's a really big deal tons of evidence showing that it's effective and it helps prevent helps prevent the spread of these not only common cold but a lot of things um it helps you know and encourage you guys to wash your hands after you go to the bathroom and after you do other things but definitely as, as in the patient world in the hospital in the clinic, um, keeping, you know, hands clean in between patients, et cetera, et cetera. Don't want to get my soapbox too much, but anyways, and here is this proper hand hy hygiene technique. Um, don't stress for this about for my class, as far as studying for it. Um, because I'm not going to have test questions over this, but this may be beneficial or this chart may be beneficial for studying for other courses or whatever. So that is it for me today. Um, thank you all for your time and attention. Please feel free, as always, to email me if you have any questions about anything I said or if you want some of these resources I talked about or, um, or anything else <laughs> that comes up. All right, I will talk to you all later. Thank you all for your time and attention. Bye-bye.